Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Helen Jenkins. I'm the Director of Development here at PEER, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another one of our Coffee Talk donor webinar series. Our talk today will uh, feature uh, Dr. Christine Berg, who you'll meet later. Um, and uh, before we get started, I wanted to offer some quick guidance uh, for today's virtual event. Next slide, please. So first things first, um, please do keep your uh, camera off and stay on mute during uh, Dr. Burke's presentation. For the best viewing results, uh, we recommend that during the presentation, you select speaker view at the top or side of your screen if you have a tablet. Once the presentation is over, you can select gallery view to see all of your fellow attendees and you can join the conversation. After the presentation, you're welcome to turn on your video. Next slide. After the presentation, we'll also have a live Q&A. To ask a question, you can click raise hand under the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. I will then call on you and you can unmute yourself to ask your questions directly to Dr. Berg. Please wait until you're called upon to ask your question. Your other option is to type your question directly into the chat where I will read it out loud and it will be answered live. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, I will now invite Tim Whitehouse, our executive director to say a few words. Great, thank you, Helen, and welcome everyone. We are delighted you're here. Uh, Elizabeth, if you can advance the slide. We are delighted today to have Dr. Christine Berg join us. Uh, Dr. Berg is an oncologist who has spent much of her career at the National Cancer Institute. We're also delighted that Dr. Berg is an important member of Pierce Board of Directors. Um, as you can see from her biography here on the screen, she's a highly accomplished and internationally recognized doctor, scientist, international speaker on public health and climate change issues. I first met uh, Dr. Berg when I was working on climate change issues in Maryland. And at that time, uh, Dr. Berg was also working from a healthcare perspective, from an oncologist and doctor's perspective on a number of issues associated with fracking, uh, dirty energy sources and clean energy sources. And we immediately bonded. I found uh, Dr. Berg was not only entertaining, thoughtful, smart, kind, and a strong humanist, but she was adamant about the scientific process and very much understood and cared about the existential threat of climate change. So we're delighted again, Dr. Berg, that you're able to join us today. Next. Thank you so much, Tim, for that wonderful, kind introduction. I very much enjoyed our first uh, interactions in Maryland, and I am honored to serve on Peer's uh, Board of Directors under such a successful, caring, wonderful leader. And I also thank Helen Jenkins for help with the presentation and Claire and Elizabeth for their assistance with the meeting. Next slide, please. Peer, as I am sure many of you are aware, does very, very important work in protecting federal employees as and state employees as they are carrying out activities to help our environment, our biodiversity, our lands, and also climate change. I had the pleasure of being introduced to George Luber by a Tim Whitehouse at a meeting, and he's an example of someone who has had a marvelous career and been extremely helpful in identifying um, health effects of climate change and has worked as co-chair of the Climate Change and Human Health Interagency Work Group and on the National Climate Assessment and the IPCC uh, Fifth Assessment Report. He was placed on administrative leave after the CDC decided to merge his program for reasons that remain obscure with the National Asthma Control Program and notified him that he would be removed. Reporters for the New York Times, supported by Peer, questioned this, reported on it, and the proposed termination was withdrawn. He is still active 
and is really beneficial to the work that uh, I'm going to be discussing and that benefits all of us here in the US and around the world. Next slide, please. This graphic is actually prepared by the Centers for Disease Control. And in my opinion, does an excellent job visualizing the problems that climate change is having. We are seeing more extreme weather, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, um, rising CO2 levels, and all of these interact to have impacts on weather, air pollution, vectors, which are things like mosquitoes that bite us, increasing allergens. If I sneeze during this, it's because we're already in allergy season here where I am and outside of Washington, DC. Water impacts, environmental degradation, and extreme heat. It's hard to analyze these things even individually and their combined impact is mounting. Next slide, please. What I thought I would do is discuss several of these issues uh, independently and to emphasize the health effects. And I thought I would start with air quality and air pollution. Air pollution, as you can be seen here with the exhaust from these cars and from our many power plants still, is associated with particulate matter, soot, uh, nitrous oxide, sulfates, and a number of other pollutants. And it also is a major source of our greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, and methane. Wildfires are becoming increasingly more frequent and severe. They are now frequently involving residential areas. So it's not just the trees that are burning, but cars, buildings, insulation, et cetera. And the particulates in this wildfire smoke are also hazardous to our health. I'm primarily working on air pollution as it's related to lung cancer and some other uh, malignancies like bladder cancer, and also using air pollution to draw attention to the primary sources of not only these pollutants, but the greenhouse gas emissions that are affecting our climate so deleteriously. Next slide, please. To explain how the particulate matter is harmful, it is necessary to really understand that it uh, comes in many different sizes and the, all of those sizes are actually really quite small. The particulate matter uh, 10 is 10 uh, microns in diameter. The smaller particles, which are the particle tens tend to fall out of the atmosphere more quickly. The particulate matter 2.5 is small enough that we inhale it, gets into our air sacs, and then from there can get into the bloodstream. These are much smaller than the size of a human hair. Frequently, you can't even see them in the atmosphere, and they come from a variety of sources. Next slide, please. The health impacts can be divided into uh, acute or short-term exposure and long-term exposure. Uh, immediately, you can have a decrease in your lung function, exacerbation of underlying respiratory diseases like asthma or cardiovascular disease. Uh, and these can result in, uh, you know, asthma can be so severe, it results in hospitalization or if you're affected with, you know, a, a gentleman I was on a trip with had been in a recent heart attack and he was in Istanbul with bad uh, particulates and we got him to uh, wear a face mask so that he could um, not breathe these in. Long-term exposure is related to lung cancer, as I mentioned, and other chronic um, lung and heart disease risks. Next slide. 
climate change can affect exposure to these particulates with increasing emissions we you know to cope with the hot air we need more air conditioning and that increases our demand uh, from our power plants and Worrisomely, there are increasing natural sources of air pollution. I showed the wildfire smoke, which can be induced by drought and heat, and dust storms, in the, particularly in the drought-stricken uh, southwest in the U.S., are a problem. You may have read about the drying out of the Great Salt Lake, as it is a basin and no water, all the water comes in and evaporates gradually, but the particles at the bottom in the sandy soil have gotten pollutants, heavy metals, toxins from all of the surrounding agricultural lands and industrial lands and residential lands. And those particles, now that they're exposed to the air, can be picked up in the, a, a dust storm and can be harmful. Next slide. A lot of research has been done on the respiratory and heart attack problems associated with air pollution, and there's increasing attention to other uh, diseases. I found this one of interest because it shows the strongest association between the PM 2.5 and Parkinson's disease in the Rocky Mountain region, including Lake County, Colorado. PEER does activities along the Front Range in Colorado as there are, there's a lot of mining there, oil and natural gas extraction. And a lot of people think of our, our great Rocky Mountain area as being you know, pollutant free, but certain areas are not necessarily. And so the link with Parkinson's disease as our population is aging is something we need to study and be concerned about. There's also links to Alzheimer's disease, pregnancy problems, and a number of other issues. Next slide. The United States has tried to improve their air quality standards, and this has been going on now for decades, very successfully. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act you know, started under the Republican Nixon administration and have been highly successful. There were amendments in 1990 that uh, brought uh, attention to these part, um, pollution uh, effects, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, lead. We're getting, we've gotten the lead out of our gasoline, but it's still a problem. Um, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and ozone, which is generated at ground level related to heat and exhaust. This, I'm not referring to the ozone layer over Antarctica, which is a separate problem, which is fortunately actually a great example of how international collaboration can be making a difference. So we have in the US really worked to improve our air quality. Next slide, please. And this, up until recently, has really, really been highly successful. Uh, annual deaths have decreased by about 47%. There's a, been a decline in particulate matter. The decline was across the United States, but however, recently in the last five years, the decline has stopped in the West and it, given the severity of the um, wildfires, that uh, pollutant it, matter is now increasing. And in fact, a recent study showed that high population centers actually east of the Mississippi can also be affected by the winds that blow from the West and have increases in their particulate matter. And so, this is a serious uh, issue. This is pre-pandemic. The one out of every 35 deaths in the United States are related to air pollution. And this equals all traffic accidents and all gun shootings combined. And so we need to pay continued attention to it. It was nice to see an article in the um, paper this morning that the EPA is working on cleaning up uh, polluting sources that the air then blows uh, 
to other states where they then have a problem meeting the Clean Air Act requirements so that this will help across the United States. And it's useful for groups for peer to be following this kind of activity. Next slide, please. A recent uh, study from The Guardian looked at all of uh, the population centers in the United States and ranked um, them by air quality. You may be familiar with uh, how we measure um, PM 2.5. It's in uh, amounts per cubic meter. And the hot spots here in Bakersfield, California are the worst in the United States. And they're at 16 micrograms per meter cubed. This is high for the United States. It doesn't compare at all with you know, Beijing, which can be up at 200, or Mumbai, which has recently been up at 300. So yes, we have pockets of high air pollution, but uh, for the most part, we are making some progress. And in agricultural areas like Bakersfield, where there's also some oil and gas extraction, we need to continue to work on this. Next slide. So I mentioned vector-borne diseases. These are illnesses that can be transmitted by mosquitoes or fleas or ticks. And with uh, the heat, increasing moisture, the ranges of these kinds of insects and vectors has increased. And according to the CDC, illnesses from these vectors have tripled in from 2004 to 2016, which is quite worrisome. Next slide, please. It's not just the heat, the climate change and variability, but land use and deforestation is a problem, uh, lack of uh, routine habitat for animals. We have a lot more international commerce and travel. Um, poverty is, is an issue, standing water uh, where there's poor drainage, uh, water storage and poor irrigation and uh, population growth uh, in various urban areas can be a problem. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea of how Lyme disease has spread. It wasn't too long ago that I had never even heard of it. You know, we first found out about it and was named for uh, Lyme Connecticut, where it was found to affect uh, deer ticks. And it spread in 1966. It was in this region in the Northeast and was beginning to spread further. But in, since up to 2018, it is spreading really substantially. And unfortunately, it's going to continue to do this with uh, animal transport and uh, increasing in uh, changes in temperature and range. Next slide, please. And even diseases that are not related to climate change, like COVID, there's still speculation as to exactly how that started. However, this interactive effect of a pandemic along with the pre-existing areas of um, our particulate matter, you can see that where there is higher air pollution levels, the it turns out that there's an increased risk of uh, death from uh, COVID-19. This is deaths prior to the deployment of vaccines, but these interactive effects are, I find, quite concerning. Next slide, please. And we're also seeing uh, more weather and climate disasters. These are getting expensive and more frequent. In 2020, we had quite a number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters, hail storms, um, drought and heat waves, fires, um, and flooding. Next slide, please. 
extreme precipitation is increasing. The as the atmosphere warms, uh, the atmosphere can hold much more water vapor, and when it does get saturated, the rate of heavy downpours is increasing. And in particularly in the northeast, we're having a lot of flooding. But conversely, climate change is also making uh, droughts worse. Um, but then like we're seeing in California recently, the drought is being fixed with these absolutely horrendous atmospheric rivers that hold so much water that flooding is occurring. Reservoirs are now overflowing, dams have to be released and mudslides are occurring. So we're not seeing the stable uh, patterns of um, rain and water availability that we had in the past that made our agricultural system so robust. And this is going to be a problem for not just uh, flooding, but for our agricultural supplies. Next slide, please. Hurricanes, as we know, are increasing in intensity as a consequence of climate change. The water, warmer water is providing more uh, rain, more fuel, heavier rain, higher storm surges. Where you know, the um, water levels in our rivers, you know, when we've had substantial downpours, are higher than uh, normal. And in places like Miami, we are seeing a rainy or excuse me, sunny day flooding where the ground level water is rising and water is coming up from below into the streets. And so that is a real problem if a, a, if a hurricane comes through. Uh, next slide, please. One thing I, as a physician, am concerned about is our hospital system, our medical uh, system is at risk from these storm surges by hurricanes. Here's some examples of um, hospitals that under, can undergo flooding depending on the severity of the uh, storm. Category five storms, you can see the, the white, or the, excuse me, the light yellow um, in Miami-Dade County, Florida, they get flooded. I have been to several radiation oncology departments. I practiced radiation oncology for a number of years and Vanderbilt you know, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, they had a uh, substantive flooding. Um, it's now about 20, 2009, 2010. And the a stream underneath the pediatric emergency room overflowed. The water ran downhill into the radiation oncology department. The water came within six inches of the ceiling. All of their multi-million dollar equipment got flooded. The patients had to go get their cancer treatment at other facilities. Uh, set up with, with in an emergency uh, basis and then continued until the equipment got got replaced. I met with the medical physicist there and I asked him what the plan was for next time, thinking that the university and the healthcare system would be approaching this. And he said, sandbags, not exactly what you want to hear about our infrastructure. Next slide, please. And also, as I mentioned, you know, the care can be disrupted with this flooding. Uh, doctors and patients can't to even get to where they need to be getting their care, let alone it might be flooded when they get there. A colleague of mine, Leticia Naguera, who works with the American Cancer Society, analyzed uh, lung cancer patients who were getting treatment and the, found out that hurricane disasters disrupt care and the length of the disaster uh, declaration um, would increase the um, mortality. The, there were more deaths the, with uh, disaster declarations than if there had been no declar disaster declaration and care had not been interrupted. And this is a problem and it's one of the things that uh, the healthcare system is working actively to try to help ameliorate, but we need to make sure we get uh, climate change addressed as much as we can. Next slide, please. 
The other thing that can happen with these hurricanes is that they can make landfall in areas where there are a lot of petrochemical plants, um, plastic manufacturing uh, facilities, and there can be toxic releases from these facilities, flooding of some of the storage receptacles with uh, uh, toxins leaking out into the surrounding area. A chemical plant northeast of Houston exploded and burned for many days. 13 Superfund sites, which are already struggling with trying to get uh, cleaned up, can become damaged and flooded. This is something we don't really think about in terms of the toxicity and health impacts associated with these hurricanes. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, you know, we can get disruption of our standard health care, but uh, Puerto Rico suffered a great deal with um, Hurricane Maria. And here's a picture of a federal medical station set up in uh, Puerto Rico. One thing that is not well um, known from the disaster in Puerto Rico was a shortage of the plastic um, containers that are used for intravenous um, drug administration and fluids. The Many of the standard fluids are actually packaged in uh, Puerto Rico, and there was a severe shortage across the United States. And as I'm an oncologist, the chemotherapy um, courses were interrupted, and that is problematic as well. And then the underlying chronic illnesses don't get adequate attention either. Next slide, please. So what can you do to protect your health? There are many apps that you can download onto your cell phone to monitor air quality. You need to make sure that as the, when the summers are quite hot these days, that you stay well hydrated. There were some people hiking in the Southwest when, recently, like last week, and there was a flash flood and one person drowned. And you need to pay attention to the uh, weather reports. <laughs> and I, uh, there's a city here in Maryland called Ellicott City that's been subject to two floods. Uh, I went to visit and was looking at the damage and a guy who lived there came up and I said, well, it, weren't there alarms? He said, of course there were alarms, but we get alarms all the time. Nobody pays any attention to them. So he didn't pay any attention. We need to pay attention to these alarms and make sure we know where we should go and how we should do it. And um, flooding can lead to mold in your residence, which can increase allergies and other health, health problems. And we need to watch out for mosquito breeding areas, ticks after bring, being outdoors, and protecting against uh, water contamination. We had to have the sewer lines in our neighborhood uh, fixed because of an EPA order, because there, with the um, flooding, there was a sewage contamination of our local stream. And so this, this needs to be, need be monitored. Next slide, please. And what is good for your health can also be good for the climate. So we can all contribute to lowering air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. We can walk and bike more, which will really help. Telecommute, this Zoom uh, conference is an excellent example of something that we didn't really do before the pandemic. And it really can help lower uh, emissions and time traveled. I just bought myself a plug-in hybrid vehicle and I've gone 620 miles without any use of gasoline whatsoever. I'm still still uh, counting and it's really useful. Uh, decreasing the amount of air travel is also very important. There are uh, novel uh, fuels being developed. There is one that may come from uh, waste plastics, which is not a good idea but there are others in development that will be much greener. Red meat, both you know, uh, beef, lamb, those um, animals eat a lot of 
um, plants that have to come from uh, like in uh, Brazil, tearing down the Amazon rainforest to, uh, to you know, make fields for them to eat. The methane that comes from the cows is also harmful. So we can do a lot with our diet. We need to reduce use of single use plastics, switch your appliances out when they need to be replaced using electric, and then ensuring that the clean energy sources that can power our grid are deployed in a cost-effective manner. And I think with advanced modular nuclear reactors uh, coming uh, online, there are some demonstration projects. Those will be, I think, uh, useful for grid reliability. Next slide, please. The Inflation Reduction Act has uh, the most clean energy uh, parts to it of any bill that has ever passed through Congress. There are many incentives consumers can use to relieve the high costs of energy and decrease utility bills. There's home energy rebate programs, electric vehicle tax credits. They're uh, somewhat complex as to where the um, parts have to be sourced, but they will still help drive um, electric vehicle adoption. The Infrastructure Act did put um, money into setting up charging stations across the United States. So the concerns about range anxiety uh, will be le lessened. And then there's consumer tax credits for heat pumps, solar panels, and water heaters. Next slide, please. And it's important that our public health uh, strategies be employed uh, well with improved active communities and you know, all the um, rails to trails efforts, um, planting uh, more uh, trees and green space, more electric uh, transport. These are all really important uh, strategies that help the public health as well. Next slide, please. And we need to make sure the monitoring stays um, good. This is where an organization like PEER can come in with assessing uh, use of pesticides or PFAS or uh, exhaust from various chemical factories, um, community and infrastructure planning with retention ponds and wetlands and increasing, as I mentioned, the capacity of stormwater systems. And we all need to be aware and have emergency preparedness, but also make sure our systems are, are intact for this. And this requires money and planning and support of the personnel who maintain these systems for us. Next slide. So in conclusion, our environmental problems can result in many different health effects. The environmental toxins, air pollutants, the greenhouse gases that accelerate climate change. These effects are occurring, and unfortunately, they are going to increase with time, but with a robust individual health system and public health approaches, we can manage these issues and we can hopefully ameliorate and, and mitigate the toll climate change um, may play. And it's an honor to work with Tim Whitehouse and Peer as they're doing their part to make sure that our federal and state employees can help us uh, keep us and our environment healthy. I appreciate the time and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Um, at this time, I welcome everyone to turn on their video so we can begin our Q&A. Uh, as a reminder, to ask your question, you can click the raise hand under the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, it might be on the side if you're on a tablet. Alternatively, you can also type your question into the chat and I will read it out loud uh, for a live answer. So let's dig in here. Um, Dr. Berg, we have a few questions already sent in. Um, can you speak to uh, the idea that natural gas is better than coal for the climate and air pollution? Is that the case? And, and what's the conversation? All right. Well, I 
agree that coal is the dirtiest source of uh, power that is utilized uh, for, to power our electric grid. Uh, natural gas, however, utilizes its methane. It's called natural gas because it's not um, synthesized in a factory somewhere, but it, methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. It's several times more potent than carbon dioxide. The good news is it um, only lasts in the atmosphere for about 49 years. It has a half-life of seven years. So after seven years, half the methane put in the atmosphere is actually dissipated, which means that even though it's a potent greenhouse gas, if we attack sources of methane, and I uh, think we need to, it, we can make a difference in terms of ameliorating climate change. Replacing uh, coal-fired plants with natural gas does lead to a net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. However, I don't think it's substantive enough to meet exactly where we need to be going. So I regard, and the our fracking revolution in the Permian Basin and in North Dakota has really led to a lot of leakage of methane and a lot of harmful effects. We're seeing earthquakes from a disposal of wastewater in Oklahoma. These are, are really problematic. So I, I don't see natural gas as a good a long-term solution for us. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. Um, are there climate risks associated with travel? And should I be concerned, or what should I be concerned about when exploring the world? Yeah, uh, it's a, a, a good question. We, um, I you know, visit our sons who live in uh, San Francisco and um, Los Altos, and they have air quality monitors, they have N95 mask. No one ever knew what an N95 mask was before the pandemic, but N95 masks are good for filtering out particulate matter. And those, I think if you're going to cities around the world that have poor air quality, San Francisco during a wildfire, Portland, I was in Portland for a meeting last fall and there were recommendations that we not spend too much time outside because of the wildfires. So I actually put on my mask. And so you you know you need to, if you're going to Istanbul or Beijing, in Mumbai, Delhi, those are all um, cities with with poor air quality. And then of course uh, flooding risks and water quality we already are aware of, but increasing um, antibiotic resistant bacteria spread of, you know, we think vector spread here in the US is a problem, but it's even more of a problem elsewhere. So I, I do think if you do travel, you should also make sure you offset your emissions or some airlines are now having plant programs to purchase more environmentally friendly jet fuel. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Please the, go ahead, Sarah. There are so many problems that you have raised. Yeah, sorry. And I I know, but that's that's not the that's not where I'm coming from. What my experience is from what I did working with EPA and just what you observe from people. One of the biggest problems is putting in systems and putting in the people as well who understand how the systems work and the people who can monitor them to make sure that they're working on their best. I think about fracking. Fracking, which has caused lots of problems and some of that's from PFAS, which is another thing that has raised its ugly head. But if fracking were handled right, correctly, that might not happen. Coal mines, which is a horrible, I don't like coal mining because I think it's, it's a horrible source of, of energy. But 
it's cheap. And for those who can't afford to go gas or coal, gas or oil, is there a way to make coal usable? And coal is coal is pretty bad. I mean, coal has all kinds of bad stuff. All your bad hazardous metals are in it. It's it's bad stuff, and we're not. And this is where roles of different agencies come in because there's a there's a site called Butler Tunnel in northeastern Pennsylvania, which had two incidences which were caused by excessive rain, et cetera. And the wine pools flooded and they went into the local stream, which then went into a local river, which was all bad things because it was transporting all the hazardous metals out because the acidic, acidity of the water was so low that all of these metals were in solution. So instead of, I, I don't want to keep going on, but there's lots of problems, but if the steps were taken to prevent them, that would be the best thing that we could do about anything. And whether prevention is by limiting these particular constituents, contaminants, or if it's by putting in not regulations, but getting more people to understand. You're talking to us, but you're kind of the people that you're speaking to the, what is that expression? To the yes. The converted. We need to speak to other people. And this is one of the problems I've had with trying to get the information out about PFAS. I can't get it to the people who really need to know about it. And so, if you say PFOS to somebody, they look at you and, and they say, huh? Yeah. And that's, a, that's about it. That's about as far as you can go. Yeah, so, Sarah, you've, you've, you've raised a number of important issues. And so let me just address um, them and uh, see if I can summarize. First of all, okay. <laughs> and so I appreciate your enthusiasm and your concern and your level of uh, detail. The I live in Maryland, and oh yes, <laughs> as Tim mentioned, you know we were active on fracking, you know a decade uh -huh. ago now. And last um, legislative season, there was a legislation passed to help restrict PFAS. So we're and. So we're setting a tone for many places in the United States that can build on our success for, for PFAS in particular. For um, renewable energy is now in many instances actually less expensive, both solar and wind is less expensive than coal, mm -hmm. even maintaining coal plants. So the costs are no longer an ob objection. For handling the has for existing coal plants, um, further um, controls can be uh, put in place, and you know, clearly, but like that flooding problem is a disaster, and we need you know, infrastructure yeah. improvements to avoid those things. But I do think that even though we can ameliorate some of the hazards of coal, I think it's going to be best over the long uh, term to phase it out with the less expensive and safer uh, renewables. We can also look at pulling CO2 out of the air. We can look at pulling yeah. CO2 out of, of the you know, chimney exhaust from the, the power plants. I think it's easier, less expensive to set up renewable sources that don't have those problems to begin with. Oh, I agree with you totally. Right? Totally, it it's it's yeah. getting those things in place that is sometimes the problem, and I guess that's where I'm coming from. Right. And no, I I think it requires efforts on all of our part, and I do try to talk to people who are not part of the converted. For example, <laughs> for example, no, I think you, I'm sure you do too. I, I, again, and I appreciate you talking to us now because we can always learn, even if we are converted. 
Right, exactly. You might be able to sing better <laughs> right. in our choirs. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Burke. Thank you, Sarah. We do have a question from Mara. Mara, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question to Dr. Burke. Oh, hi, thank you so much, Dr. Berg, for a wonderful presentation. Um, very informative and yet very scary. Um, I, I think scary is where we need to be right now is scared. I have a question. I have a background having done years ago energy law um, and, and some energy regulatory law and, and looked at that. But so I follow that closely. Solar, we talked about, you know, cheap sources. Solar is a, it has a great future, but I'm curious as to the, the downside, well, two downsides. One is I've always seen is there's not enough investment in the grid because yes. people don't make money by investing in the grid. They make money by investing in production and transmission to some degree like pipelines, but not the grid. So the grid has been in a bad sh shape for a long time and see what happens in California. They tell everybody to go solar electric cars, but don't plug in your car because right now the grid can't support it. So it's a problem. Right. Right. So I have two questions. One has to do with if you if you see any future investment in it, it's a big thing for infrastructure in the actual transmission grid. And the other is specifically for solar, as opposed to say something like wind, the, the environmental degradation from the production of the panels and the equipment. Solar itself is great, but it's got a really ugly underbelly. And is anything really being done now to come up with a solution for that aspect of solar that you know of? I am not an energy expert. Thank you for working in energy law and regulation. It's, it's so important. I think that you know the infrastructure bill and Tim can um, elaborate on this. I think there was money for uh, grid um, improvements, which is clearly critical to transport the wind from West Texas or the you know, solar energy from our desert. So that is critical in terms of the life cycle analysis of solar and wind and you know I, I, it's it, I, it's it, the whole life cycle is not as green as just the energy um, produced but it's still much greener than uh, coal or or natural gas there are a lot of technological improvements um, there is for battery storage, for example, there was a nice paper article. I read The Economist. There was a big article about how to make graphite, F, which are which is used in the anodes of the batteries, more environmentally sustainable and get good, clean graphite. So there's a lot of um, technological improvement work going on. I my my I I do give talks, but my best contribution to the environment was raising a uh, power systems and controls engineer who's working on renewable energy storage. And what they did in uh, California is set up a system for um, home uh, batteries that they installed these power walls. And it, when the grid's under stress, the owners can be pinged to turn over some of their extra uh, power that's in their storage back to the grid. So they have this new system set up for the power wall um, users to, to help support the grid. So there's technological improvements going on. Tim, did you want to make any comments about yeah, I'll, I'll just say great questions. I know um, grid improvements uh, should be a national priority. They're slow improvements, but not fast enough. I know in our area, some of the solar tie-ins have been denied because of the grid isn't stable enough to absorb some of the um, clean energy applications. Um, my observation on solar and the life cycle is um, we can't forget about energy efficiency. So uh, even if we switch over to all solar and all wind and we continue to consume more and more energy, uh, those that tr important transition will be self-defeating. So uh, we always need to keep energy efficiency at the front at the forefront of um, our efforts because any energy system consumes uh, energy to create it and uh, uses resources. So um, 
life cycle solar and wind are much, much better than coal and natural gas, but we have to think about energy efficiency. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Mara, for that great question. Uh, Dr. Berg, we have a question in the chat from Don Ferber, and he asks, with all we seem to know about toxins, toxics and pollutants, what are your thoughts on how much more we don't know? For instance, PFAS has only gained recent attention, and even that is limited with all the different varieties out there. And there is the matter, too, that we are exposed to too many different pollutants, and we don't know the cumulative impacts. Your comments. Excellent uh, observation. And I think that it, you know, it, it's, it is unfortunate that we don't have as much data as we need. Some of the industry um, details are behind um, the uh, industry. Um, what's the term I'm searching for, Tim? Their trade secrets. <laughs> their ability to, you know, uh, their own. Um, <laughs> I think the, there are several words you're probably looking for. One might be trade secrets and trade secrets. Claim their That's studies it. or trade secrets or confidential business information. Yeah, right. Exactly. Sorry, I was at a loss for words there for a minute. Yeah. The, so I think it's a it's a problem. And I think we need to know more about the cumulative effects and uh, long term exposures. And I think that it's something we need to you know, have peer help us with making sure that we have um, employees that can have the right expertise too. You, you learning about these uh, chemical compounds, you know, you actually have to take organic chemistry in college and that's hard. <laughs> so the, it's, we, we need a lot of uh, education and training. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Uh, we do have a question here from Sarah. Please unmute yourself and ask your question directly. On the subject of PFAS and his many, many little variations, EPA actually had a really good short program today. It didn't go into great, it was a half hour program which specified what they consider MCLs. And this has been one of the problems that they have not stated anything. Way back when, in 1999, when I went out to Mr. Tennant's farm, came back and said, it's PFAS. I had never heard of PFAS before that. And what I was told by EPA was, too bad. It's not a hazardous constituent. So one of the problems that we've faced, this is what I think. And so when you talk about the companies and their patents, that's part of it too, but it's also things like for 3M and DuPont, who are the main users of PFAS, it works so well for them. They don't want to stop it, DuPont in particular. And so they were supposed to find something else back in 1999 when I was saying it's PFAS that's killed this man's cattle and it's PFAS that's killing a lot of people that live there. And it was kind of like, well, I was speaking blah, 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 blah. So these are the things that we have to contend with. And it's carried over into state regulators because I find my state of Pennsylvania where we have a site in my neighborhood where clearly PFAS is one of the major problems because of the health issues there. And the state has blinders on until the most recent testing. They hadn't tested for PFAS at all. Although the facility, the operation used it because that's commonly used in that type of so these are things, as well as getting messages out to people, it's also, how do you get to 
whether it's mm -hmm. EPA or your state regulators, and get them to do something. Some Thank you, Sarah. Is, Sarah, I just want to be respectful of time here. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Uh, Dr. Burke, did you want to just comment on that? And then we do have another question. Yeah. The, each state has its own challenges, and it really takes a lot of uh, grassroots activism and also coordination among the various environmental groups to work towards uh, changing the regulation and enhancing monitoring. And there's nothing like an informed and active citizenry. And it's very time and labor intensive. I've learned a lot in the process in Maryland and you would think it'd be easy here, but it's, it's difficult here too. And it's, but keep up the good work. So there's another question, Helen? Yes, uh, the other question is, um, are medical professional associations taking stances on climate change and what are clinicians most concerned about and advocating for? I'm attending a meeting next, uh, so this upcoming Sunday and Monday uh, called the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. It has, the majority of the medical societies in the United States. Hi, Hudson, you're waving. <laughs> okay. Um, it has the majority of the medical, medical societies in the United States belong. They have signed uh, documents explaining the issues regarding the health effects of climate and many of these groups participate with an organization called Healthcare Without Harm. All healthcare should you know, minimize our, the harms, but there are many approaches that healthcare groups can take to lower their own uh, climate footprint. Healthcare makes up about 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions, much from pharmaceutical manufacturing and transport. And there are concerted efforts. Our American Society of Clinical Oncology is coming out with a policy statement on what they're going to be doing. So it's a, a growing movement and I've been honored uh, to be a part of it. In terms of individual clinicians, it depends on the specialty. Allergens, the increasing allergy season, you know, spread of Lyme disease, awareness of all of these things and making sure our patients are aware so they can take the appropriate uh, protective measures is critical. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, Tim. Yeah, I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Berg, for speaking to us today uh, for a very insightful and meaningful discussion. I did also want to go back to something Sarah Casper said that I think many people on this uh, webinar may have missed. Uh, she mentioned Dr. Uh, Mr. Tennant in West Virginia. And um, for those of you that don't know Mr. Tennant, he was uh, the cattle farmer in West Virginia in Parksburg, Parks, something like that, West Virginia, featured in the Dark Waters movie where the, his cattle were dying. And I believe, Sarah, you were one of the early investigators on that case. Um, and I wanted to bring that up both to thank you, because you've been working on that issue for many, many years, um, when, when I think people were uh, dismissing PFAS as a concern. Um, but also to highlight that we're involved, whether it's climate change or PFAS or loss of biodiversity, these are real generational struggles. You know, these are things that take, you know, years and years to address and decades to address. And looking at some of the names of the people I'm familiar with on the call, I know so many of you are involved in these struggles and just want to thank you. Thank you all um, for your work and um, to thank the peer team. And, uh, you know, we'll keep fighting. Um, I think the public health angle is, is so crucial and uh, public health professionals, doctors um, are a key part of the education of all of us about the impacts of climate change and chemicals and the loss of biodiversity. So again, thank you, Dr. Bird, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate your attention. Thank you all. With that, we will close the meeting. If you have further questions, please feel free to contact us directly. Have a good one, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye.